today is titled The Taller the Tree, the Harder the Fall, Determining Tree Height from Space Using Deep Learning and Very High Resolution Satellite Imagery. Uh, like I said, my name is Ferdinand Schenk. I'm a machine learning engineer at a company uh, called Liveio. We're a company that's uh, based in Berlin. And uh, just to give you a bit of like uh, context for why we would care about how tall trees really are, uh, just a bit of context about the company. Liveio is an Earth observation company, as the name says, Live Earth Observation. Um, so we take input data, which is mostly satellite data. We process the data through our analytics platform, and which is, includes a lot of machine learning. You can see the marketing guy made this slide, AI. Um, and then we turn this into customer output, which is actionable insights that you know, our customers can finally use. Uh, like We have three products, and I'm going to highlight one of them today, which is called TreeLine. So TreeLine is vegetation risk modeling for line infrastructure. So this is effectively railway lines, uh, power lines, or gas pipelines. And we're effectively trying to tell our customers, hey, what risk does this vegetation pose to your uh, infrastructure? Uh, why is this important? In the US and the EU, the leading cause of power outages is vegetation interaction. So this is when either trees fall over or trees grow into your power lines, uh, causing outages. Uh, and you know, generally a bad time. If you're in dry places, like for example, California or Texas or Australia, then uh, vegetation interaction can even cause fires. And for the companies that operate these power lines, if they are found to be negligent, uh, then they can actually be held liable and they can be fined and then they have a bad day and they get a very big uh, fine. And you know, this causes fires, which you know, is it, the environmental impact's big and it's dangerous to people. It's definitely something to be avoided. So basically what we do is by accurately determining the risk of vegetation around this infrastructure, uh, we can reduce maintenance costs and outages. And yeah, that's basically the value offering that Liveio has. So on to the fun stuff. Um, so basically there are a couple of factors that go into risk, uh, you know, like the different factors that play into what risk vegetation poses to infrastructure uh, can be stuff like species. Uh, different species of uh, trees have different root structures. Some get blown over more easily in storms than others. The other thing is uh, vitality, so the health of the vegetation. Sick trees get blown over much more easily than healthy trees do. Um, but the one we're going to focus on today is the risk due to height. Uh, why height is important is especially because it doesn't matter if your power line is 20 meters up in the air, uh, if the tree is only 2 meters saw it can be as sick as it wants it's not really gonna affect you at all and our customers really don't care it's, it poses effectively no risk so effectively we only care about the trees that are above a certain height and so then we classify this for our customers as in trees that pose no less uh, uh, no risk low risk medium risk or high risk and then we give them this information and they can then go do something about this especially when it's something like a very tall tree that might be of the wrong kind of species and is also sick this is a very risky tree that they would want to go do something about about. So today we're just going to focus on height. All the other aspects are also interesting problems in their own right, but height is the topic of today's talk. So how do we actually calculate the height of vegetation? So you could go around uh, walking around the power lines with you know, some kind of measurement device and measure every single tree, but the customers we work for often have thousands to tens of thousands of kilometers of power lines. Um, and you just can't do this manually. You need some way of doing this at scale. Uh, and the way this is usually done in remote sensing is by using digital elevation models. There are two types. I'm going to get to that quickly. Um, we use a canopy height model, which effectively tells you like what is the height of the canopy of this tree. So it's effectively uh, an image where the X and Y entries into your image are the latitude and longitude of the object. And the actual pixel value just tells you the height of that object. Uh, how we actually get to the canopy height model is a little bit more complicated because you can't, we generally those things are not just available. We start with the digital surface model, which is a model of the surface of the Earth with everything on top of it. This might be trees or buildings and everything. And then we take a digital terrain model, which is the surface of the Earth without all these things. We subtract them from each other and we get our canopy height model, which we can then use to determine the, tree, the heights of the trees or buildings if you want, but we focus on trees. So it's called the canopy height model. Um, yeah, so how do you actually get a canopy height model? One of the most used ways to do this is actually using LiDAR. 
So now you can't use LiDAR from space, but LiDAR is usually done from aerial platforms, so it'll be planes or uh, like helicopters or increasingly drones. Um, LiDAR also gets used in other, a lot of other contexts, but for the context that we're using it, it's you know these kind of aerial platforms. And there's a really a lot of nice things about LiDAR. Like the LiDAR flights are often in contact or are pretty much always in contact with GPS satellites, so you have like super accurate precision for every single point that you do. And they also have like very high point densities of like 30 to 50 points per square meter. Um, so it's really a lot of data that's coming in. So this is rough a cartoon of what this looks like for LiDAR. You might get a nice big point cloud, which tells you which points are ground, which points are vegetation, and that's a pretty easy way of telling what these things look like. Uh, from the ground points, you can get your terrain model. From the uh, tree points, you get your surface model. You subtract them, you get this. So the nice thing about LiDAR, it's the gold standard in terms of quality, super high centimeter resolution accuracy of height, and you can even see through vegetation because the point density is so high, much higher than the density of the leaves. You can actually, some of the points of the laser actually go through the trees, see the ground beneath the trees, and you can get an idea of what's underneath the trees. The downsides of it, the capture times are a little bit slow, and especially the processing time. So between when you actually do the flight and when you get the data, um, it can be quite a long time. It can be quite expensive because you have to pay for an airplane, you have to pay for the pilot's time, you have to pay for the fuel, you know, all of that. And it's not very global. It's a very region-dependent uh, like technology. So in every country that you operate, you need to hire a new company that does this. You need to have new contracts. You need to have new work. You need to have you know work in certain seasons, and it gets a bit expensive and it gets a bit complicated. So is there another way of doing this? And it turns out there is. You can actually do use stereo satellite images. So stereo uh, satellite images just means basically two satellite images taken from different angles of the same location. And by with a little bit of like clever processing, you can also create a digital surface model using two satellite images. And that's effectively, you know, the nice thing about this the satellites is they're global. You don't need to like talk to a new company. You have one provider that works for you all over the world. Uh, satellites also image like very large swath areas in like one go, which means you do a large area and you know, the delivery times are relatively quick between when the satellite takes the image to when you get it. We're talking like hours to days, but in our world, that's great. Um, yeah, and just a note about very high resolution satellite images, because resolution is pretty important in this case. We're measuring trees, which are, you know, of the order of meters uh, of size. Um, so we're using very high resolution satellite images, which is means very high resolution usually just means sub-meter images. So the satellites we're working with have ground sampling distances of about 30 to 70 centimeters per pixel. So every pixel is roughly this to this big. Um, so yeah, this is an example of what one of these satellite images looks like. Uh, can anyone tell me what area is being imaged in this picture? Berlin. Yes, it's Berlin. Nice. Uh, so, uh, you know, the if, if you look closely, if you have very sharp eyes, um, the game against Turkey was played right over there, behind those little clouds there, unfortunately. I'm sorry about the game last night. You don't win them all, but at least you guys won that game, so yay. Um, <laughs> But uh, if you ever come to Berlin, Livio's offices are right over there. Uh, you know, we're very nice. Come visit us, say hello. Uh, but we're over there. And I realized in this image there is, yeah, okay. So just a little note about this image first. Uh, just for context, this is an example image. This is about, I cropped it a little bit just to fit into the screen a little bit nicely, but the mother image is about 40,000 by 40,000 pixels um, at four spectral bands, so red, green, blue, near infrared. Uh, it's about eight and a half gigs on disk, and if you're doing this kind of stereo processing, you need two of these images, which means that's quite a lot of data that you actually have to process through to really create this. So it really is like a big data problem at this point. Um, I also realized while looking at this image, there's actually something I can use here to describe a little bit about how this actual, uh, how we create these DSMs or how we actually calculate height from images. And so it's right over here. If you've ever been to Berlin, this is the TV tower, which is the tallest. It's a very like uh, iconic piece of the Berlin skyline. It is the tallest building in Berlin. It's actually the tallest building in Germany. I, th I think about 360 meters. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty tall building, and I think it illustrates the point that I'm trying to make quite nicely. So this is what the TV tower looks like from above, seen from the satellite image that I just showed you. If you know, just like zoom in on the little bit that you want here. Um, and you can see I put two dots here. I put one dot there at the very tip of the tower and one at the very bottom. Uh, if you now look at the other image that has been taken from a different angle, you can see that the 
uh, parts of the image that are on the ground don't move very much, they're very low. The parts of the image that move a lot are the parts that are very high. So this is effectively how you can determine the height of something. Like we call this the disparity, which is just given one image, how many pixels did this, pixel mo this object move into the other image? And if you know uh, what the angle is between the satellites or between the two cameras that took this, which is the satellites that took this, you can actually calculate the height of every pixel um, that's visible, at least in both images uh, in your image. So yeah, this is relatively straightforward. This is the theory behind this. How do we actually do this uh, in practice? So actually, stereo vision is actually a very well-studied problem in computer vision. People have been doing this for quite a long time, um, even to the point where you can do it in effectively five lines of Python. Uh, this is uh, an example from the OpenCV documentation. So effectively, import it, read the images, and then you can use this algorithm called Stereo BM Create, which I think stands for Stereo Block Matching Create. Under the hood, it uses an algorithm called Semi Global Matching, which is a uh, non deep learning or non machine learning, like just a classical algorithm that effectively goes and searches for pixels in each image and gives you a result. Straightforward, right? This is uh, just going to work. Like uh, nothing, nothing can ever go wrong. Um, yeah, so we thought this would be relatively easy, and that was our first attempt, and we found out, like, you know, it's not that easy when you actually get down to it. Uh, this was effectively our first little, like, dose of reality that we ran into. Um, so just to give you an uh, explanation of what's actually going on here, this is a top-down view of a location. That's a field, and there are some trees on the side of this field. I just used it as a bit of an example because it shows what's going on. Uh, the red line is just where the cross-section is drawn, and this profile view down here is the cross-section. Um, so just imagine that that's the ground, and these objects there are trees uh, that you're just seeing the surface model of. Um, so the red line here is the digital surface model that was created by our reference LiDAR, and the black line is what we got when we used semi-global matching. Um, so in principle, we want to uh, have these things be the same or as similar as possible, but of course, that's not what happened in this case. In this case, we effectively completely failed to reconstruct the tree on the left-hand side, and if you do the calculation there, that tree is about 20 meters tall, which is a really big tree to miss. Like, that's a real problem. And the tree here is a little bit smaller, and we didn't completely miss it, but we reconstructed it about like half the height. Now, if you go to your customer and you say, hey, this tree is only 10 meters tall, they get out in the field, they actually look at it and it's 20 meters tall, they're going to be very unhappy with you, they're going to stop paying you, and your business is going to die. So this is a really big problem for us. We had to come up with a solution that does a little bit better than this. Um, so actually, if you do your research, the signs were actually there. Um, you know, like if you read a lot about like a lot of computer vision methods and especially these stereo methods, uh, you realize that like a lot of things that work maybe on buildings or other things really stop working on vegetation. Vegetation is always an edge case. It is over and over. We could have saved ourselves a bit of time if we just like read a few more papers. But the th yeah, you always get there. Like vegetation is always an issue. Um, so yeah, that's the thing. So how do we get around this problem? How do we actually make something work for vegetation? Um, oh, just to give you an idea of like possibly why this is happening um, is just that at the resolutions that we're working at, which is you know pixels of about this sort of the side, uh, vegetation is like semi-transparent. So if you are, for example, taking an image from right above of the top of your tree, uh, it might be a completely example, green pixel, because you're just seeing leaves all the way down through it. Um, but if you then take your second image at a different angle of the top of your tree, um, you might actually be imaging the top of the tree for part of the pixel and uh, also behind the tree, which means you might get a different color pixel. And a lot of these more naive algorithms actually work by just matching the colors and say, hey, this object in here in this image is roughly the same color as this object in this image, meaning I think this is the disparity. That's a little bit oversimplified, but that's roughly how it works. Um, and this is a problem, and this is a problem why it doesn't work for semi-transparent objects like vegetation, and it also depends on species. Some species are very dense, have very dense leaves, and algorithms actually kind of work on them. Um, but some trees like eucalyptus trees in Australia are really, really sparse, and they really don't work. Um, yeah, but to me, this is starting to look like a bit of a machine learning problem as a machine learning engineer, um, because m machine learning algorithms generally don't you know, work more semantically. They don't go like, oh, this is this color. It's more like, oh, this is this object, or that's the idea of what you want. Um, but I wanted to be sure. Like, I wanted to be sure just because I'm a machine learning engineer and, you know, all I have is a hammer. I don't want everything to be a machine learning problem. I just wanted to have an idea of, like, you know, is there some truth to this? Uh, and it turns out, yes, there are some better methods. I don't know if anyone knows this, but this is the Kitty Vision Benchmark Suite. Um, 
so effectively, this is a benchmark uh, from the autonomous driving community or from like at least uh, mobile vision. And what this effectively is, is again, two images that are mounted on some cars that have driven around and with a LiDAR sensor. And then you have the images and the LiDAR and from the images you have to infer the depth. Uh, so a lot of the research that's been done in the last like couple of decades on stereo vision actually comes from the um, self-driving car community because yeah that's where a lot of the money is flown. So if you read a lot of papers on stereo vision, there's a heavy bias towards like uh, you know autonomous driving. But if you look at their benchmark, you will see that the method we were using, which is semi-global matching, and that's the OpenCV implementation, is about number 310 on the on the leaderboard, which is you know pretty sad. Um, and all the top methods are really deep learning based methods. So I think there's, you know, really something to this. The deep learning methods just basically blow the other methods out of the water at this point. Um, to give you a bit of an idea of like what these results actually look like, this is an example case from that Kitty benchmark data. Uh, like here is the base image and in the bottom left is the prediction from semi-global matching. As you can see, it kind of gets the big picture things correctly. Um, but it really fails on the details, like all the details are really messy in here. Whereas the deep learning algorithms really do a good job of like having cohesive items. And because in our images, our, you know, our the trees are often just a few pixels wide, we are really just working on the details. So for us, the details are super important. Um, you know, we don't have the same restrictions the self-driving community has because there they need to li do like real-time inference and everything has to happen super quickly. Whereas for us, we generally do the processing offline. So, you know, we have, we have a different set of constraints to work under. Um, so the first step is data. That's always the downside about like actually training any deep learning models. You need quite a lot of data to actually do this. Um, there's not actually a lot of data out there for what we need. There's a lot of stereo data sets out there, but they're often synthetic data sets, and they're data sets that someone created in Blender of little objects flying through a room or something, um, you know, which is useful, but there's a large like distribution, like diff change in like, uh, you know, th what's being imaged. It's very, very different from satellite images. Um, so we had to go create our own training data set to do this. And how does one actually do this? I could talk about this for an entire talk because, you know, like all good machine learning projects, like 90% of the work was actually just getting the data into a format that you can actually train on it. And the last little bit was modeling. Um, but yeah, basically we need a set of stereo images of a location um, that we would have taken. At the same time, we need a LiDAR data set of the same location from a similar time. Um, the similar time is especially important for us because we work on vegetation and vegetation isn't static. So if there is too large of a gap between when the LiDAR was imaged and when the actual pictures were taken, the trees would have grown or would have been cut down or you know, any kind of change would have happened and your dot, you'll just be introducing a lot of noise into your data set. So we kind of have to filter this to be as close as possible in time, which is a pretty strong restriction. Um, then we have to co-register the data with the stereo images, which is also another big challenge. The thing about geospatial data is it also is, it's, you know, you have images, but they're also associated with a place. So we also have to make sure that the LiDAR and the images and the images themselves line up with each other. Quite a lot of work went into that step as well. Um, but yeah, and then we had to actually create the disparity maps. The disparity maps is just the, the target that tells you like, oh, this pixel in this image moved X amount of pixels to the right in the other image. And we did this by projecting the LiDAR points into both images and then calculating the difference between where they ended up in each image. Um, yeah, and then calculate, yeah, basically, where they based that, uh, where they ended up in the different images, that gives us the disparity. Uh, I just want to shout out a couple of cool Python packages we use for this: Rastrio for reading geospatial images, PDEL for reading the lidar point clouds, and some code we wrote in uh, JAX to do the projecting into the images. Just because we're projecting millions and millions of points in there, so you know, doing this in just pure Python doesn't really work scale very well. So, how do the models work that do these kind of calculations? Um, this is just a cartoon of how these models work, um, but they all roughly, well, okay, there's two, but roughly a lot of the models follow this basic architecture, which is you have the two images. You encode uh, your image using some kind of C uh, convolutional neural network. You do some kind of processing on it and you build a cost volume. What this cost volume effectively is, is an embedding for every pixel in, e in the left image and every pixel in the right image. And you're effectively trying to see like, okay, which 
embedding of this pixel on the left image matches the embedding of the pixel on the right image. So unlike the other like naive methods, which says like, oh, what is the color of the image uh, of the pixel in each image? You're saying like, oh, what's the embedding of the pixel in this image? So this works a bit more semantically. So instead of being like, oh, this pixel is green, this pixel is green, it's the same thing. It's more like, oh, this is the embedding for you know a 32-dimensional vector of whatever of the top of a tree. This is the same. This also looks like the top of a tree, and this gets matched like this. And then you have some process and regression and upsampling, and this hopefully gives you a disparity map that you can use. Um, so just a little bit of a note uh, on this. As I said, a lot of the work that's been done on this has uh, is often done from robotics or from, uh, you know, like self-driving cars or so, in which case your cameras are always pointed uh, like parallel. So you put your cameras, you point them parallel, and th this simplifies the calculation greatly because your disparity only moves in one direction. If you think about it, a little bit like uh, if you have an object in one image and you have a parallel camera in the, in the other image, like any motion is only going to be one directional. This is not the case for us uh, because uh, when we take these images, it's done by one satellite that has to come over, take an image, fly a few thousand kilometers, take the second image, and it needs to rotate. So you have these crossing sight lines. Um, so we can't get away with that simplification. Uh, so we can't just like take any of the like normal models just off the shelf and have them work. We need to generalize things a little bit. Uh, we needed to go do a little bit of like uh, model surgery because uh, and like make sure that they can actually deal with these uh, with this kind of like positive and negative disparities. And yeah, that's what we needed to do to make this work. After we did this and after a little bit of training, uh, we saw what every machine learning engineer dreams of seeing, which is you see the loss go down and you see your model learning actually what it's actually supposed to do. It doesn't actually look this great on the screen, I'm sorry about that, but that's effectively kind of what we're working on here. We work on uh, uh, a kind of left image, which is the image from the one satellite, uh, the right image, which is the image from another satellite, and uh, then, you know, this, this is the prediction of the disparity, which it's a little bit washed out here, but believe me, it kind of looks the same. Uh, and yeah, we saw our model starts learning, starts reconstructing, especially the vegetation and not just the buildings, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, yeah, going back to the same example that we had before, these are the kind of results that we now got. Again, there's the LiDAR and the semi-global matching, and you can see in this case, our uh, method here actually gets pretty close to what we got from the LiDAR. Uh, yeah, so we were super happy when we saw this, and this is exactly what we want to see. We've improved a little bit since the screenshot, but that was kind of the first big aha moment for us. We were like, ah, okay, actually, this works. This works much better than what else, you know, whatever we were using before, and kind of gets us into the same range as LiDAR, but with, you know, without all the disadvantages we had previously with LiDAR. Um, yeah, so in production, like you might have noticed, uh, this little, I told you those images were about 40,000 pixels by 40,000 pixels, and I think this is about 512 pixels by 512 pixels, so, you know, we can't just, that's a lot of little patches, and also because we have customers with 10,000 kilometers of power lines, we often have, like, thousands of image pairs to work through, so it's, it's a lot of data. So, you know, uh, einmal ist keinmal, as the Germans say, we're a German company. I tried to translate this into Dutch. You have to tell me how far off I am. Ein keer is geen keer? I don't know. Yeah, probably. Okay. It basically just means, like, doing something once doesn't really count. Like, you know, it only matters if you can do it, like, over and over. And so, yeah, for the large jobs, we often have hundreds to thousands of stereo pairs that we have to process. That is, you know, single digits to double digits, terabytes of data that need to get processed. Uh, so this is really not something we can just run on one machine. Um, so, you know, at up to 50,000 pixels, we can easily be doing inference on hundreds of thousands of image patch pairs. So you can imagine this takes a bit of time and quite a bit of computing power. And yeah, we've automated this all using Ray and Prefect. We can orchestrate this for large scale inference. So we can do this on single images at a time, or we can do this at hundreds of images at a time uh, to really get this through in hours instead of, you know, maybe days that this would have taken if you were trying to run it on something smaller. So yeah, conclusions. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that height plays an important role, that in well, height is an important factor that uh, in the risk that vegetation poses the infrastructure. Um, stereo satellite imagery is an efficient and cost-effective way of measuring vegetation height at scale. At scale is a very important part here. And uh, yeah, traditional computer vision techniques, while they might work well for some use cases, are actually inadequate for vegetation. And yeah, deep learning-based techniques can accurately reconstruct vegetation height uh, from satellite imagery. 
yeah, thank you very much. My name is Ferdinand. Uh, I work for a company called Libio. And yeah. Thank you, Ferdinand, for the great presentation. Uh, I'm sure that this will raise some questions, so please raise your hand. So what do you think about uh, the results from a neural network-based stereo? Sometimes it makes up uh, depths. Do you trust the results? If d Does it miss things? Does it make things up? Uh, we have to be, yeah, and that's one thing where we have to be very careful, and we did step into that hole at some point. Um, you know, we have to be very strict about, like, making sure that everything that's in the image is seen in both images. Because if you don't do that, and you just ask your model, like, hey, what's there, and it doesn't see it, um, like, then it, it will just make something up. It'll give you an answer. Um, what we've actually been working on is actually having the model quantify how sure it is about a certain pixel. And that plays a very part, large role in like making sure that we only take the pixels for which the model is reasonably sure about the result for. But yeah, I mean, that, that is a big part of it. Yeah, so, so could you miss a high tree then, for example, if there's no sure data around that patch? Yeah, I mean, yes, that is definitely a possibility and definitely something you don't want. I mean, in general, we tend to miss smaller things. Like, th as you can imagine, like the generally the things that get missed are things that are smaller and take up fewer pixels. And they Which would probably them. also fail in the in the classical stereo, yeah. anyways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something we put a lot of thought into: how to make sure that like everything we predict, we're pretty sure about. Um, yeah, and we're trying to still improve that, but you know, we we have ways around that. How did you manage to get labels uh, for uh, the training set that you used to train the model? Um, yeah, like I said, we used lidar data, like. So we had to make sure we were taking images uh, of somewhere where there was LiDAR data at a similar time, um, which is actually a bit of a challenge because uh, uh, we haven't actually gotten someone to fly LiDAR ourselves. Uh, what we usually do is we use some kind of open source, or like some kind of open LiDAR sources. Uh, so quite often governments open their LiDAR. In the US, there's a lot of free LiDAR you can download. Um, but the one big restriction for us was dates, um, because you know even though there's a lot of free LiDAR out there, it might be very old, in which case it's kind of useless for us. So for example, what we've done is we've taken the schedule of like some German federal states, and they said, like, oh, you know, who have open data policies, and they said, like, oh, we're going to fly a LiDAR thing this time next year. And then we took images at that time and then matched up the LiDAR data to the images we took and then use it like that. We also like just look through, like cross-reference some archives, like the, there's some archival data from our providers, and we said like, oh, okay, um, this area was imaged in this time, please look if there are any images that were taken at that time, and then we matched them up, and then we created our data using doing that. But yeah, that was, that was a lot of work. Thank you. But uh, um, when you get LiDAR, uh, LiDAR data, um, do they give you also the height or just the image? And if they don't give you the height of the trees, how do you train the model? So how do you get the actual heights to use in your training set? So uh, they don't, I mean, the LiDAR data is their point clouds, um, which you can very easily, which trivially you turn into height because it's literally uh, latitude, longitude, and altitude. So that is that. Um, but we have to turn it into something that we can use. So we have to turn it into the disparities. But if you know what the angles of your cameras are, you can go from disparity to height or from height to disparity. And so to create the training data, we go from height to disparity. And then when we do the prediction, we go from disparity to height. Thank you. Sure. Um, great presentation. How long did it take the whole project? <laughs> because it's. Even waiting for the data, for the LiDAR to happen, sounds like a year. And then f going from this initial model that didn't really work, the final one. It's yeah, like I mean, ages. it depends on what you say. Like, I if it's like the deep learning part was probably from like when we started the deep learning stuff to it actually getting our first results. We were in a bit of a rush, was maybe like three or four months. 
but this also built off a lot of work that was actually done like before I joined the company actually which was done a little bit on trying the um, the more classical method so a lot of the infrastructure and things were there and yeah the first couple of data sets we we got we basically just uh, did the thing where we took the archive and we were like okay uh, where is there images and data at the same time and just had a bunch of people sit there and like process these things and look through this uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, that was kind of good our first results. So I would say it was like order of months, but building on work that maybe happened for a year. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you, Ferdinand. Um, there will be a keynote uh, by Sam Aaron in 10 minutes, and then we will close the event and there will be some drinks. So I hope to see everyone there, but let's first give uh, Ferdinand one final round of applause. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks.